If we look at this game, most of you are probably familiar with tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses. This is a game where you start with a three by three grid and one player is putting X's and the other player is putting O's and you take turns and w if one player can get three of them in a row horizontally, vertically or diagonally then they win the game. So you can start with the empty board, you know, one player has nine choices, the next player has eight choices and so on. So you have this game tree, sometimes the early moves because of symmetry you might not have to consider all of these. In reality you really only have three choices at the beginning. You either play in the centre or on the edge or in the corner. When the game ends at a leaf in this tree you can assign <coughs> a final value. So here uh, X has got three in a row so that's a win for X so that's plus one. Here there's three O's so that's minus one and here it's a draw so that's treated as zero. So once we've got this tree, what do we actually do with it? Well, even, I mean, this is a relatively simple game. It's possible to search to the end of the tree, but let's, for illustrative purposes, let's just start with something even simpler. So let's pretend, who wants to pretend they're playing this game with me? <laughs> yes? <laughs> you. Okay, so Max and Min. So this is the way it works. Um, you're going to choose first and you have a choice between A1, A2 and A3 and afterwards I have a choice between three options depending on what you chose. And then at the end this shows the amount of money that I have to give you in dollars. It, theoretically, we're not going to really... <laughs> <laughs> so, right, so you want to get as much money as possible and I want to be a cheap bastard and give you as little money as possible. Right? Now, if this was a path planning problem, you'd have a tendency to think, well, there's a 14 here, the 14 is the biggest number, maybe I should choose that, right? But in fact, you're smarter than that, right? So which one would you choose and why? You choose the three, you choose A1, yeah? Okay, why is that? Right, if you choose A1, then I have to give you at least three dollars, right? But if you choose one of the others, I can get away with giving you two dollars. Right? Can everyone see that? So A1 is the best choice. And this is the fundamental idea behind all of these uh, zero-sum games. That one player is trying to minimize and the other player is trying to maximize. And we can implement this by actually doing a depth-first search and working our way up the tree. So th this person chooses the minimum of these three values. So the minimum of these is three, and they do that for each of these nodes. So the minimum of this is two, the minimum of this is two. You assume that the other player is going to play good moves, right? So if I move here, I'm going to get three, here I'm going to get two and two. So this is the better choice. So it's the maximum of these three. So the number written at each node represents the reward that you expect to get if both of you make the best possible choices. And this is how we actually can write this in a computer program. It's a recursive program, so this is similar to the recursive version of depth first search. So you give it a node and you tell it a depth, so this tells you the maximum depth that you're allowed to search to. So the depth, you know, if the depth starts out at six and then at the next level it'll reduce to five, four, three, two, and when, it get, when the depth gets to zero, that means I'm not allowed to search any further in the tree, so I just have to return some heuristic value. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or if it's a terminal node, if it's the end of the game, obviously I just return the final value and don't search any further. All right, but if it's an interior node, this is where we distinguish between max and min. So if, we, if we're the ones who are playing at that node, then we want to get the maximum reward. And so we go through the children one by one and find the maximum value, and that's what this code does. You just set alpha initially to minus infinity, and then for each child, you recursively calculate the value for that child with the depth reduced by one. And if the value that comes back is bigger than alpha, <coughs> you replace it. And if it's a min node, then we want to find the minimum, so we set beta initially to plus infinity. We evaluate 
all the nodes recursively. And if we get a value smaller than the one we had before, we replace it. So that's minimax. Now it turns out if we're just given a graph like this and we want to trace it through by hand, this version of the algorithm is the most convenient one. But in practice, if we want to code this up in a computer, we may need to store more information. This is just a basic shell. And then we may need to put more information here to do the heuristic evaluation and keep track of other information and various other things. And if we write it like this, we've kind of got duplicated code. Every change that we make here, we have to make a corresponding change here. And the whole thing becomes a bit annoying. So there's actually a, a better implementation, which is called Negamax. Now what this does is it always evaluates the board from the position of the player whose turn it is to move. With the ordinary implementation, we think of the wh you know, white pieces and black pieces. But with the Negamax implementation, what we think of it in terms of R pieces and the opponent pieces. Because, I don't know, most of you probably be familiar with chess, but you know, if I'm playing, so let's say I'm playing white and I want to evaluate this position, but then you, let's say you change the board around so that every black piece gets replaced by a white piece and vice versa, and then it's black's turn to move. Well, theoretically, their evaluation should be exactly the same, right? Because it's really just about who's p my pieces and their pieces. Yeah? This, that's what this Negamax builds on. So if the node is terminal or the depth is zero, we return the heuristic value of the node from a perspective of the player whose turn it is to move. What we do is we always maximize. We don't alternate maximizing and minimizing. We always maximize because we're always evaluating the board from our own perspective. But when we do the recursive call, when the answer comes back, we put a minus sign. Because this recursive call evaluates the board from the perspective of the other player. So if it comes back with a value of 3.7, then from our point of view, it's minus 3.7. Right? So anything good for them is bad for us. So by putting this minus sign in, it just simplifies the code a lot. We don't have this kind of repeated structure. What are the properties of Minimax? Now the hint here is that it's built on top of depth first search. It's doing, it's doing a different kind of computation, but it's traversing the tree in exactly the same way that depth first search would. So the attributes are going to be exactly the same as for depth first search. It is complete so long. <laughs> now remember, depth first search was complete so long as we avoid repeated states. What does avoiding repeated states mean? Well, it means you can't, you're not allowed to put the board back into the same position that occurred before. Otherwise, the game might never end. So some games like chess and go actually have specific rules that um, either forbid. In go, it's actually illegal to put the board back into a previous state. If you, if you try to do that, you lose immediately. In chess, I think the the same position can occur twice, but not three times or something like this. Is it optimal? It is optimal if you're assuming that your opponent is also playing optimally. If you believe that your opponent can make a mistake, you possibly can do better than this. And one of the tutorial questions next week, or one of the exercises, is to actually think about tic-tac-toe. So you've got three choices in tic-tac-toe. You can go in the center, on the edge, or the corner. If you assume the opponent is perfect, then all three are equally good. If you assume the opponent can make a mistake, it turns out that one of those moves is much better than the other two. So have a think about that um, and, and why that is. Time complexity, b to the m. So what is m here? Well, it's the number of moves in the game, which could be very large. And the space complexity is good. It's B times M because it does depth first. You know, we talked about how depth first search can, doesn't have to keep too much in memory. All right, now with a game like Tic-Tac-Toe, we can search easily to the end of the game. There's a maximum of nine moves, in fact. But uh, if we get to a serious game like chess, the number of possible board states is astronomically large. The branching factor is about 35. For chess in the mid game, you've got a choice of about 35 different moves. And a typical chess game could take about 100 moves. So if you figure this out, you know, 35 to the power of 100 is probably larger than the number of 
atoms in the galaxy or something like that. So you couldn't possibly search to the end of the game. So how do we, how do we deal with this? So this is this tension about the uh, computation time. So how do we deal with this in practice? Well, there's two ways to do it. So the first is we don't search all the way to the end. We just search to a limited depth. But then when we get to that node, we have to come up with a heuristic estimate of the value of that node. What's our likelihood of winning from that position? What, is that position better than another position? So we have to look at heuristic evaluation. And the other thing we can do is called alpha beta pruning. It turns out that you don't actually have to search the entire tree. You can prune off some sections of the tree and yet still be guaranteed to get the same answer. So let's first look at heuristic evaluation. There's this traditional rule of thumb about how much pieces are worth on the board. If a pawn is worth one point, then a bishop and a knight are typically thought to be worth about three points. A rook is about five points and a queen is about nine points. So the simplest possible evaluation for chess is just to look at what pieces are still on the board, assign these values to them, add them up, add up my pieces, add up the opponent's pieces, subtract it off, and that gives you the value of that board position. And it turns out, if we can search 14 moves ahead and just use this very simple evaluation function, that actually plays a pretty good game of chess. We have to deal with a certain, there's a certain few complications about check you know, if someone's in check, we may have to sort of extend the search a bit and this kind of thing, quiescent search. There's a few uh, subtleties like that, but it actually plays a pretty reasonable game. Okay, but let's say we want to improve on this. Well, one way is to give some fractional score for a particular piece being on a particular square. We get three points for the fact that our knight is still on the board and hasn't been taken yet, but you may get a little bit of extra value for the fact that the knight is here compared to, say, here. So if the knight is here, it's kind of more in the middle of the board, it attacks the center and so on. So you might say, well, I'm going to add a bit of value for that. You know, maybe I add 0 0.4 or something like that. If it's over here, maybe I subtract 0 0.2. I'm just making these numbers up. Later on in the week 12, we'll actually talk about how to learn these values, how to how to train them by machine learning. But I'm just saying like, you could have 64 different values that you add on depending on what square the knight is on and the same thing for the pawns, the queen and the rook. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? What else? Well, you could have features that say that one piece is attacking or defending another piece. Let's suppose the white knight was here, then you would have a feature saying that the black bishop is attacking the white knight and the black pawn is attacking the white knight but the white knight is attacking the bishop and the pawn and perhaps the king. You know, so you'd have these extra features that aren't about categorically where the thing is on the board but the relationship between pieces. So common chess programs these days use exactly these kind of features. Now, the other important thing to understand about this is that the computation is very fast. So, six different types of piece, two players, 64 squares. You, know, you add all this up, the total number of features becomes something like 1850 or something. It's nearly 2,000 features. So, it sounds slow, but in fact, the way it's computed is very fast because most of these features are zero for any given position. So if you think about the black knight, for example, we have 64 different features for the black knight to be in different squares, but for any given position, the black knight is only in one, on one square. You know, the white knights are on two different squares. So we just use a lookup table. We have a, a table of 64 values and we just look up in that table which one the thing is on and add that in and maintain this sum. So it's, it's actually, we can calculate these heuristics very fast. 
Well, now let's talk about pruning. Now, again, I know you're not expert chess players, but I tried to find a position which is fairly self-explanatory. So let's suppose I'm black and I'm thinking about moving my queen to this square. Would that be a good move or a bad move? <laughs> That's a terrible move. Why? Because the, knight will take it. because the knight will take it. Exactly. If I move my queen here, the knight will take it. I get a queen for free and I've also put him in check. So it's a really bad move. Now notice the key point is you only needed to think about this in order to know that that's a terrible move. Right? There's all sorts of other moves I could do. So this Minimax would consider every possible reply. Minimax would say, okay, they moved their queen here. What am I going to do? Well, I could move this pawn up one. I could move this pawn up two. I could move that rook. I could castle. I could move my queen here. You know, we consider all these sort of funny, silly moves. But in fact, really, that's just a waste of time. A human certainly wouldn't consider that. A human would say, okay, because the knight can take it, this is obviously a really bad move. So this is the key insight. To prove that a bad move is bad, you only need to see one good reply to it. But to prove that a good move is good, you have to think about all, all possible replies. So that's the intuition behind this pruning. Now, how does the algorithm actually work? Well, let's go back to our previous example. And let's suppose that it actually, these numbers are not given to us for free. We have to do some computation to get those numbers, right? And so we've got the first few numbers, and then there's a couple we haven't uh, found out yet. But what do I know? Once I get to this point, how much do I already know? Well, I know that if I make this choice, I'm guaranteed to get at least $3. If the other player is playing optimally, that's exactly what I'll get. Well, I'll get at least $3. On the other hand, once I've seen this move here, that means if I make this choice, then I might be forced to accept only $2. Yeah, you know, these other numbers might be even lower. <laughs> this might actually be worse than $2, but I know I'm not going to get any more than $2. So I already have enough information to know that this choice is better than that choice. Is that clear to everybody? So I don't need to evaluate these knowns. I can prune them off. And this might save me a lot of computation. Now what happens when I get to this last one? When I see the 14, well, I'm still not sure what is the best choice. I know I can get $3 there, but if I'm lucky, I might get $14 here. And then when I see the 5, I think, well, okay, I might get 5, but not more than 5. And then when I see the 2, I say, okay, I'm not going to get more than 2. So it's worse than this. So two important points here. So the first thing is that by doing this analysis, it prunes off parts of the tree and saves us computation time. The second point is the order in which these moves are examined is important. And it's always best to examine the good moves first. This is a good move from the point of view of this player because it's low. So I examined this good move first and that allowed me to prune off these others. Here I examined the bad moves first and didn't get to the good move until the end. So I didn't get any value from the pruning. You know, to go back to this example, yeah, it's, it's because I thought about this good reply of capturing the queen that I was able to prune off all these other choices. If I considered the other choices first and then this last, I'm not saving myself any time. So it's important to be able to look at the good moves first at every level of the tree, if we can. What I've shown here is only a two-level tree. I've really only showed you alpha pruning. I haven't shown you beta pruning. But the same algorithm can be applied to trees of any depth. And I'll show you an example in a minute with a tree of depth 3, and the algorithm applies this reasoning at every level of the tree. As I said, it's, it's, it's thought that John McCarthy was the first person who actually wrote this algorithm down. And when you first see this algorithm, you sort of scratch your head and it looks really kind of a bit uh, alien and unusual. But as you get to play with it and know it more, you really uh, appreciate the beauty of it. So it's very similar to the Minimax algorithm with just a couple of differences. So 
as well as the node and the depth, we pass in values of alpha and beta at each level. So we're calculating the maximum here and the minimum here, but under certain circumstances, we cut off the search and don't evaluate the other children and just return the value that we have. And this is if alpha becomes bigger than or equal to beta or if beta becomes less than or equal to alpha, that's when we cut off the search. Now, I'm going to show you in a minute an example of actually tracing through this algorithm with a, on a piece of paper. And then I hope it'll become a bit more tangible to you at that point. Just the same as with Minimax, we can also do the Negamax implementation of alpha beta. So when we trace through something on paper, it's much better to use this implementation because we can see which is max and which is min and we have a better idea what's going on. But in a computer, the Negamax is actually better. And as you can see, it doesn't split up into these two cases. It's always maximizing. But then when we get the answer back, we negate it as before. But also when we pass alpha and beta down the tree, we swap alpha and beta and we negate them. So there's little quirks of this algorithm. But you know, alpha and beta get passed down as minus beta and minus alpha. So here's a, here's a tree. And it's the same kind of game as before, but now we have three moves instead of two. So max makes a choice first, and then min, and then max. All right, so let me show you how, the al how to trace through this algorithm. Let me just so we always start with alpha is minus infinity and beta is plus infinity at the root. When we go down the tree, alpha gets copied to alpha and beta gets copied to beta. Now, because this is a max node, we're changing alpha. So 1 is better than minus infinity, 2 is better than 1, and then the value of 2 gets passed up the tree. Now this is a min node. A min node always changes beta. So 2 is better than plus infinity. Then we go down the tree again, copying alpha to alpha and beta to beta. Now 6 is better than minus infinity. And this is the point at which be alpha becomes bigger than beta. So this thing here, if alpha is bigger than or equal to beta, we cut off the search and we return alpha. So we chop off any remaining children of that node and the value of 6 gets returned up the tree. Now this is a min node. So it's changing beta, but from its point of view, 2 is better than 6. So it passes 2 up the tree. This is a max node, so alpha gets replaced by 2. <laughs> now we move down the next branch. Alpha to alpha, beta to beta. 0 is not as good as 2. 3 is better than 2. So 3 goes up the tree. So the th this is a min node, so the beta gets replaced by 3, but there's still, beta is still bigger than alpha, so we still have to keep searching. So alpha and beta form this kind of window, and as long as there's still finite space in that window, then we have to keep searching. Uh, so 4 is better than 2, and then at this point there's a cutoff. Right, alpha has become bigger than beta. So this node gets pruned off. Four goes up the tree, but three is preferable. So three goes up the tree, and now alpha becomes three. <laughs> okay. Then we go down again. Alpha is three, beta is infinity. Now here... 1 is not as good as 3, 2 is not as good as 3, so the 3 goes back up the tree. 
beta becomes 3. Now, this is an important point. If it's equal, that's good enough to cause a cutoff. It actually says less than or equal to. So this part gets pruned off, and that's it. Okay. So a couple of points. So first of all, it's equal. Now, the reason I mention this is because if you kind of search around on the internet, you may see versions of this algorithm, and sometimes you may see a less than sign here instead of less than or equal to. And that's actually a mistake. And it's easy to see why people make that mistake. They think, oh, it's, it's really very unlikely that any two positions would have exactly the same evaluation, so it's, I'll just put less than. But it's actually it's not about two positions having the same evaluation. If you look here, there's actually only one leaf position that has a valuation of three, but somehow this three has come back up the tree and down here, and then it's come here, and then it's come back to here. <laughs> you know, it's kind of gone all around like this and come back to here, and, and that's why we see a cutoff, right? So if you did put less than instead of less than or equal to, you might not notice the difference because the algorithm would still run and it would still give you the same answer, but it would take a lot longer to run than what it should. There are some other versions of the algorithm to solve the problem. Sometimes in, in addition to alpha, people have another variable. And, but if it's done in this way, then you have to have that equals in there. Now, another point is notice how a whole subtree got pruned off here. So a subtree with two nodes got pruned off at once. But if you're searching a larger tree, there might be a subtree here with you know, depth seven. This subtree might have 5,000 nodes in it. And we just prune it off like that. <laughs> you know, so this is the power of the algorithm, that it's it doesn't just prune off individual nodes, it can prune off entire subtrees. And just the final point I made is, let's, let's look at these prunings and try to understand, let's try to put into words the logic that's being exposed here. So what is the logic of pruning this? Well, Max is saying, look, if Min makes this choice, they're going to, guarantee themselves to pay no more than two dollars but if they make this choice i can force them to pay six dollars so i can see enough information there to know that they're never going to choose this make this choice it's great to see the six dollars but it's too good to be true it's this is in the chess position it's like min is moving the queen out and max is capturing it it's just too good to be true. They're never going to make do such a silly move because they've got better options, right? So that's why this can be pruned. The same logic applies here. And what about this one here? Well, because these were equal, what that means is the following, that if Max makes this choice, they're guaranteed to get themselves at least $3. But if they make this choice, they're not going to get more than $3. We sort of lost a bit of information here. What this actually means is that they might get $3 or they might get even less than $3, right? In this case, they're only going to get $2. Now, later on, when we talk about learning, you know, there's slight variations of this that actually preserve a bit more information. It would be helpful to know that this is actually only $2. But this is the most basic form of the algorithm. So this is saying, because this number came back, that says, no, I looked, I looked to see whether I could find something that would get me more than $3, and I didn't find it. So that's why it comes back with the three dollars. And so on that basis, you can prune off this branch. Okay. So like I say, it's um, the algorithm. When you look at the code, when you first look at the code, it, it looks a bit, you know, just wild and crazy. But if you actually trace through a few examples, you get to become more comfortable with it and understand better what's going on.